And you are listening to Single Serves. My name is Arno Marchere, and I am your host. Single Serves is a podcast dealing with design, architecture, business, and city building in which I interview an expert on a specific subject matter. Together, we dive into that topic and challenge conventional thinking in a thought-provoking conversation. For our inaugural season, we have some great guests lined up and you can expect to hear about such topics like social media for architects, organizational culture, criticism in media, and architects not practicing architecture, among many others. I sincerely hope that you will find these conversations as engaging as I did and learn a thing or two in the process. Don't forget to send us your comments, criticism, and praise. To do so, you can email us at hello at rvltr.studio or leave a comment online. You can also subscribe to the podcast on our website at rvltr.studio and follow us on social media under the handle at revelator underscore T-O. It's R-E-V-E-L-A-T-E-U-R underscore T-O. John Plumpton is an architect with 25 years of experience, primarily in the areas of attractions, food service, and mixed-use projects. He started Revel House in 2015, serving the same markets, but with a focus on the Canadian market specifically. During the pandemic, he released a number of speculative projects called Revelius, aimed at analyzing how people use public spaces in the city. So thank you very much, John, for being on the show. Thank you, Arnaud. It's, uh, it should be fun to talk about some of these ideas. They've, they've gotten some interesting feedback. So can you tell us, uh, in your own words, who you are and what you do in three sentences or less? Uh, I'm an architect that specializes in experiences uh, more than just simply buildings. Um, I specialize in sort of social attractor spaces like attractions, uh, food service, and mixed use. And... That's kind of it. And I'm trying to make an impact in the Toronto market and Canadian market best I can. Well, we're going to try and help you doing that a little more. Um, so the topic for today is going to be public space in Toronto. But before we get to uh, that specific city, I'd like to zoom out a little bit and talk about public space in general. And what, in your opinion, are the cities that uh, lead the way in that sector or in that realm? Uh, well, there's a lot. I mean, the the super cities are the ones that have always done it well. And I actually think their public spaces are what lead to that uh, because they become more attractive. So, you know, your New York's, London's, Paris, the big cities all tend to have been built around amazing public space and public connectors. Um, and there are other projects throughout the world and, in, and what's happening in Asia, they're trying to uh, create those attractors before they actually start doing the full developments. And I think that that's that's the most interesting part of it. And I think we have to start, if we're going to be a world-class city and what we strive for, we have to start comparing ourselves to these, um, this level of quality. And I think we accept too much right now that's of inferior quality. I mean, there's great efforts being done, but I don't think we have to. I think we can leverage what we have here uh, with a little bit more um, uh, ambition and kind of achieve it. But, uh, you know, the spaces in those other cities are undeniably better from in the public realm. And that makes sense. Do you have maybe one or two examples of such spaces that you really think have made a, a difference in one of those cities? Yeah, I think one, one space that I always kind of bring up, um, and f- because it's one that everybody knows, and I, and, I've, and I always love it, is a space like Bryant Park in New York. And the reason that I bring it up is because it actually um, has all the components that a lot of our spaces lack. And it's not about, think about public spaces, uh, here we tend to do public space and a lot of leftover spaces, fringe areas, outskirts. The thing about places like Bryant Park are it's the edges that make the thing work. It's incredibly intense. It's a void within a lot of activity. So the contrast is what makes that park work. work. And then the fact that they animate it and are more than willing to kind of work with private, a, a sort of a, a public private hybrid makes that thing uh, really effective year round. So no matter what's happening, they've got this thing programmed but also because of where they positioned it, they also have enough critical mass to make it happen. You can't do it in areas that are off the beaten track and expect the success they have. So that's an extreme example because it's you know right in the center of midtown Manhattan. But I think that um, 
those ideas can be replicated to smaller degrees in other pockets uh, in our city and in other Canadian cities. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you've alluded to a couple of things in describing Bryant Park as to why it was a great space. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on that? What would be like the main attributes that you would want to have in any public space that claims to want to be successful for, for its own city? Yeah, I think a really important part of public space is its edges. So um, if you look on the, you know, assuming this space is, is square, no, no, not all square, but basically the continuous edges around it and how those spaces communicate with it, um, I think are as important as what's in the middle of the space. You can design a great park, but if you don't have the right edge conditions that are activating the space and supporting it, then it's never going to be what it could possibly be. Um, and, and because, and, they, and they've leveraged, and the idea about it though, and this is something that when we were doing ours, we're trying to leverage, we're not, we're not asking for miracles out of the blue. What we're saying is let's leverage what we have to its maximum potential. And that's what they've done in a park like that. Central Park does an amazing job of it. Millennial Park in Chicago does an amazing job of it. These parks do really well because they have incredible edge conditions. And then the irony is they build on themselves. So once you have something like that, everybody wants to be there. So now it's, it's going to get richer, stronger, more active, uh, more accessible, right? And that's another big, huge, big part of this is um, they're very accessible because they're, they're easy to get to. Uh, they're not out of the way for anyone. And they're part of your daily life. Mm -hmm. And that's what they should be. You shouldn't have to drive to a park to enjoy it. There are nature trails and there's lots of other parks you can do that to. Yeah. But the fact that so many of our projects you actually have to travel to, as opposed to being a part of your experience, your just daily experience, I think is something that we can improve on. So would you say that it's, it's one of the things that's missing the most in Toronto is interesting edges that could help activate those spaces? Yeah, firmly believe it. And if you go around to the spaces that um, do have some, activity in them they're you know they're enjoyed and they're revered and uh you know i, I i'm just going to take the you know the contrary view on some of them and say we get a chance now to fix them and uh they maybe get a little too much credit i give a perfect example uh is ontario place mm -hmm. so people are now it's hot because it's still in the government's hands is what they're going to do with it we've heard the new plans for the esports arena um and we all know the stories i've, I've worked on on projects in ontario place for 15 years and uh, and knowing a bunch of the general managers. So I had sort of a lot of inside information on how that project, how that space works. And the reality is it's a little bit off the beaten path and people don't want to acknowledge it. It does not have a direct transit line to it. Mm -hmm. um, it once you're there, it doesn't have very much going on, particularly after they close the park. It has basically nothing going on. So as they develop it, and there's a lot of push to make it a parkland project and parkland should absolutely be a huge component, the majority of the project. But beyond that, it runs the risk of being once again a little out of the out of the money on this thing, and I don't use shouldn't use the word out of the money, but it's a little bit out of um, out of the uh, the critical path here. And I think that if they reconsidered it and other projects, they could actually do pretty well. But um, it's it's a huge challenge with the mentality of, of parks in the city right now. And, and that's a very interesting example because I actually live um, fairly close to that park, and unless you drive it's really hard to get to even on a bicycle. It's not that easy. Um, and yeah. there's that, uh, I don't know if it's still a, a project or if it's actually going forward, but the Ontario line, do you think that would fix the issue? I think it'd make a huge improvement to it. Uh, it would get you halfway there. Mm -hmm. So what happens when you put the lines in, they inevitably spur development. The challenge is going to be getting the right development down there. Um, and I think they've got an obstacle because I think that they have been scared off from some of the private development that's that's been um, suggested or built on in some of these spaces. And so they're so nervous about involving private de uh, developers in the project or private management. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think they should be. I think what they should do is learn how to leverage them and work with them better and actually kind of exploit them. They want to be there because there's now going to be a lot of activity down there and they should use it to their advantage so that we can get these things. Ontario Line's a perfect example. I, when I worked on Ontario Place 15 years ago, we said the first thing is she was running a streetcar down there because mm -hmm. the streetcar actually runs north of the CNE. So yeah. it's incredibly difficult once you get out of there. You have to wander your way through an empty exhibition place, figure out how to get across Lakeshore Boulevard without getting run over. Yeah. And then when you get there, there's nothing to do. You're just, you're on the water, which is nice, but not enough for enough people to do. Mm -hmm. So I think this is their opportunity, but I don't think 
I think if it's done effectively and carefully and thought out, I don't think they should discount private development or having more uh, robust, more dense uh, amenities down there. So they can drive it year round. That's the other problem with some of the parks is it's, it's almost like they forgot that we're a 12 month winter city. Yeah. You know, they're wonderful, like beyond nice uh, six months of the year. Mm-hmm. But the other six months, they're a struggle, right? Oh, it's tough to be by the water in the middle of winter. It gets it really, really cold. Cold. Yeah. yeah. That makes yeah. sense. So uh, let's let's zoom out a little bit and go back to uh, Revelius, which is the series of case studies or speculative case studies that you've been working yeah. on. Can you tell us more about that and uh, specifically what was your intent behind it? Uh, you know, honestly, it, it, it's it. You know, it was a COVID thing. We were had some downtime. There were ideas that we were talking about. We just moved into offices on Queen's Keep. So we would stare out the window at, we we're right across the street from Sugar Beach. We'd stare out the window and look at the islands. And yeah. uh, we'd look at the islands and we'd look at the waterfront and we'd be like, why can't this just be so much better, right? Like it, it just, they're difficult to get to. Once you're there, they kind of overpromise, under deliver. And we thought, you know, instead of sitting around, you know, complaining about it, let's come up with some ideas that we think are viable. And so the first one was to actually put a footbridge to the islands. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was a bicycle footbridge. And as it's designed, it cannot accommodate vehicles. So yeah. everybody, so we're trying to take out all the veto votes. Nobody wanted vehicles or neither do we. I think it's great to not have vehicles there. Um, so we did some research, figured out how it actually could be done. And then uh, proposed an idea that said, put it across the um, Eastern Channel. Uh, the ships can still go in if you do a swing bridge and it solves so many problems so you get 12 month accessibility you don't have to wait for the ferry or frankly i mean you know the ferry to me is one of those romantic ideas that is so far past its time it runs on diesel it's a really polluting um obstacle and for accessibility it's incredibly difficult so if you're in a wheelchair or you're not mobile even getting to the ferry terminal is an issue getting on the ferry is an issue and then having to wait to get off the island is an issue if we would just you know acknowledge that and try to make the islands more accessible i think it'd be great so they only get about uh i think what were they saying seven hundred fifty thousand visitors a year that's incredibly low uh but yet everyone talks about it like it's this you know revered thing it's clearly not because you would have a lot more attendance than that um so they're doing the master plan they, they'd announced they were going to do a master plan and so we thought we would lob the idea out um it got a lot of traction actually it ended up with a reddit stream we ended up on cfrb radio uh, the stars picked up on it um there's people who called me want to be involved and so we don't know where this one's going to go uh we're just trying to promoters of it we're not trying to get a job out of it some people and then people accuse us of all kinds of things um but it really was quite literally to improve accessibility 12 months a year to the island mm-hmm. that's it because we, you can do all of those other master planning things but you're not going to get any significant investment or improve accessibility by just running the ferries the way you're mm-hmm. doing it now so an improved ferry terminal only goes so far you got to do a lot more than that so did you get any pushback or was it mostly positive? Yeah, we got some. It's really funny. You're going to get pushback on for everything, right? So people people accuse us of trying to commercialize the island and build. One person said, why don't you just build Burger Kings there? And, and we're like, okay, so that's fine. You can think that. But there's nothing in there that suggests. And that's our, that's our comment about Ontario Place too is because it's owned by the city, they have control as to what actually happens there. They don't, you don't want a Burger King. You don't have to have a Burger King. I don't want a Burger King there, but mm-hmm. um you can control it. You, you get to write the program. You get to decide who gets the contracts. You get to decide when it's open, when it's closed. So you can do whatever you want. But, uh, you know, the sort of nostalgic part of it is the kickback was just leave it alone. I mean, that was the primary kickback. Why, why are you even bothering with this? People talked about this. No one wants it. Go away. But reality was, though, 80% of the people were 100% supportive. And what was so like, the, the response from the actual residents of the islands? Yeah, so when I was on CFRB, they had a resident on there. Uh, he was nice enough, but he was just like, we just don't want people. And so th- that argument got shot, shot down pretty quickly because, you know, I, I think it's a really, War Town is really neat. And, but it can be circumvented because the road, the access road, as you, if you've been out there, you have to cross a bridge to get to it anyway. They can, they can actually keep as isolated as they want, but they don't own the island. They, they have leases on land. And I think that's great. And let's keep that. But there's no reason why more people can't enjoy the island than those people year round. Um, you can yeah, that both. would make it's sense. It's not an either or. You can have both. Especially if it's a, a public amenity, like why would a certain class of residents have more privileges than others, yeah. right? Correct. Um, 
And what about your other projects? Uh, can you tell us some more about those? Yeah. So the next one we did. So then we did, couldn't get off the we couldn't get the waterfront out of our heads. So then we did um, the Young Street Basin. So we did a project uh, uh, that said, you know, on Toronto for about 200 years had filled in the waterfront, and and in particular, there's about a 50 year span. 50 to 80 year span where they were really filling in the waterfront. So I don't know if everybody knows this, but basically um, Front Street to Lakeshore in that area down is all fill. Yeah. So anything south of the Gardner is all fill anyway. Mm -hmm. And then they just stopped. And what happened was they, you know, everybody knows they didn't do a great job um, the first go around on the, on the harbor front. It was too industrial. When they finally put up buildings, they didn't connect very well with the waterfront. They didn't connect all with Queens Key. They've been doing a lot better work uh, subsequently, but there's still opportunities to have all these inlets. So if they're trying to do a nice promenade trail, you're trying to, if you're trying to go from one end of the waterfront to the other end of the waterfront, there are huge stretches. I will suggest 50% of that um, walkway, that piece of circulation is incredibly substandard. So you are being forced. You're not, you're barely on the water. You're mm -hmm. always being pushed because of the basins. You're always being pushed back up to Queens Key. Mm -hmm. And then there are ports where you have to go around condominium buildings. Then you go around, Harbor Castle, you can't get around the south side right now. Then you go past the Young Street Basin and we're still keeping you north because you have to cross the sugar uh, factory. Yeah. So th it's connection to the city, it connection to the water is completely lost. So, and people who sort of argue for it, I, you know, we're just sort of, we're struggling with it. How could you argue that it is working? It's not working. Uh, what they did years ago uh, made some improvements but they never finished the execution of it. There was ideas of these things called wave bridges out on the edges, which would have really helped. But there's, there's huge opportunities. So instead of just going, oh, it didn't work and complaining, we're like, okay, let's we'll come up with an idea that fixes it. So the idea was take the most important basin by far, which is Young Street Basin, bottom of the subway line, bottom of the street, most important street in the city, mm -hmm. um, intersects with the LRT, has a massive hotel complex with it, and is kitty corner to the biggest development in the history of Canada. Okay, so it's got nothing but people and no public space. Fill in the basin almost to the end, use that piece of land to access the ferry terminal because right now you have to walk through private land to get to the ferry terminal which i, I find bizarre mm -hmm. and then make a park and make that park for the celebration of indigenous culture so you get to the bottom this is where it all started right we know the stories we know the story of the blue the blue footsteps and it's wonder wonderful stories and let that resonate down there and then create a public space that lets people get out to the water and there's no loss and mm -hmm. so when, you, when we found out what the downside was, and we got a lot of kickback on this one. So we got, this one was more like a 70, 30 positive. Mm -hmm. So people were like, leave it alone because you can't touch the boating. So, you know, in that case, we really didn't have much sympathy for the fact that, you know, private boat operators trying to run a new club or, or sailing thing was going to dominate over the millions of people that would go into that park yearly. Yeah. Isn't there plenty of docks around the city anyway? They're all over the place, you know, and, and they didn't completely get rid of an inlet either. We actually pushed it in about 40 feet. So you could have water taxis, you could still have a sailing school, you could still have all that. It's just you don't need all the rest of that basin. That basin is over 200 feet wide um, mm -hmm. by, you know, 300 feet deep, or about 150. Um, and then ironically, we just found out that that's actually uh, where they're going to pop the new LRT out. And they are going to build a bit of a park there. They're going to infill it, but not really for a park. They're going to infill it because they're going to rework the entrance of the Harbor Castle Hotel, mm -hmm. which is a little disappointing to us because if they're going to do that, why not keep going and build the, build the rest of the park? Yeah. Um, there's sort of a park, parkette down there, which is really landscaping for turnaround. But, you know, we're not going to give up. That's one that we I find really interesting because the opportunity is huge. Um, it's what people want. They want to get down by the water. They want to touch it, right? Mm -hmm. Did you have any more substantial pushback, like beyond people saying, oh, you can't remove the boats? No, that, no, that was mostly it. We we um, said some questions in Waterfront Toronto during one of their presentations. And they, you know, we said, made a comment about the Red Path. We made a comment about the basins. And they said the basins are an important part of the waterfront experience. And, and industry has always been a part of the waterfront. So we're not going to touch either of them. And we're like, Okay, that's that's pretty lame. We're not gonna, yeah, we're not going to get anywhere with on this one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a good opportunity. We weren't suggesting getting rid of all of them. We're saying take take one or two of them. But Young Street in particular, people can see it when you go down there. It, it's sort of very obvious mm. that this is the best opportunity on the waterfront to do something. So as much as you're doing on the wonderful projects on the East End, like what they're proposing is fantastic. 
Um, but they've kind of given up on, on the middle. So they had some nice projects on the West End, um, at, down around York. And then as you move across, that's where you have the problems around where the ferry terminal is. Mm -hmm. And then the projects again, pick up again around Jarvis. But you know, our opinion is let's not give up. We didn't, we didn't finish, they didn't finish the job down on the waterfront. So they've kind of moved east on everybody, Portlands and the rest, but there's still work to be done in, my, in our opinion. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with you. And then uh, did you have a couple more uh, of those rebellious studies? Yeah, we did. We did. <laughs> we did a quick one for King Street. Um, and the idea was, this was really straightforward. And uh, it was that when they did the King Street pilot project, I was working at King and Peter at the time, knew a lot of the restaurateurs were my clients. And the story that was being sold, told by the city wasn't actually accurate. It was not successful for, the, for those people. It was a disaster. Um, but the idea of having a, a pedestrian oriented street is a wonderful idea, mm -hmm. but they kind of left them on their own. And then the, you know, the issue with the cars being there sometimes and not there, and you have to build your own patio. So there was a lot of loose ends to it. So we thought, you know what, what, if, here's an idea, go all in, if you're going to do it, go all in. So we proposed from Bathurst to Portland to make it, uh, completely pedestrian, no cars, uh, little buildings and kiosks on the street, like the nature market in Vienna. Mm -hmm. And it could run tw 12 months a year instead of three months a year, like they're doing with the patio programs. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are tracks up on Adelaide. So it would slow everybody down when this thing's running, but that would be weekends and nights. And they would swing the streetcar up uh, Bathurst, up along the top on, on Adelaide, where there are some streetcar tracks, and then have to lay down some new tracks on wherever you want, Portland, Spadina, whatever. But you would be able to uh, circumnavigate. So you wouldn't even have a streetcar running through that street. So that would be potentially your kind of distillery west zone yeah i think once you got that people would flock to it because if you've been there on a, on a weekend night it's jammed anyway yeah was the idea to remove the streetcars permanently or or remove no. them during no. uh, peak hours peak hours um, so during the mornings you would be still running the streetcars mm -hmm. uh just peak hours um and that's interesting because if you, in I guess most people keep going back to Europe and some of the spaces you find there, mm -hmm. but I grew up in a, in a town where you had streetcars and most of the lines were on a dedicated right of way. In yeah. some sections, they would run through yeah. public squares, yeah. but you would have no cars. You just have the streetcars yeah. and it's full of pedestrians. And then um, when the streetcar comes along, people just get out of the way for 30 seconds. And then they yeah, just... you're right. Yeah. Nice is a perfect example of that. Yeah. It, the streetcars uh, run through all, all kinds of public spaces there uh, without cars. They, they set the cars down at certain times and run the streetcars. So you could do it either way. They just slow the streetcar down. That's part of it, right? So when mm -hmm. it's going through that zone, you announce it, you have a, a signal to safety. Um, yeah. There's no reason to not run the streetcar through. Mm -hmm. um, and then maybe on, on fest, uh, festivals or something, then you only then you close it. Yeah. Or Saturday night, you only close it on Saturday night. And then there's an idea. Um, but I don't know, we're just looking for, you know, when they did it, it's sort of, you know, we're just frustrated by when Toronto does it, that they do it, are they 100% committed? It seems like it wasn't a committed, it was, that's what I guess they called it the test pilot. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, it's almost like if you're going to do this, let's go all in, let's commit 100% and see what happens. Because I think it'd be a huge success, actually. I think people, and with the amount of development in that area, people would, would, would flock to that location. Yeah, and, and that seems to make sense. Uh, why do you think, uh, because that's something you, you, we see in not just in public spaces, but pretty much in any city building activity in Toronto, why do you think they are never able to fully commit and go all in and try things that are truly innovative and potentially game changers? Um, I, th I think there's two reasons to th and there's a solution. Um, I think that for whatever reason, uh, well, the first two reasons are connected they're naive about the finances. Mm -hmm. So these things cost millions of dollars and billions of dollars. And rail deck park is a perfect example. Mm -hmm. So they pitch a rail deck park, which is a great idea in a great location. It was just and asked, they, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because they never, they, but then when you found out the backstory, it was never going to happen. So it's frustrating that they pitched it because it got people really excited. And as they pitched it, they said, they're not going to have any private development on it which mm -hmm. didn't make any sense in any case, because even just a place to get a cup of coffee would have been nice and yeah. washrooms and the rest. Um, and also something has to pay for these things. So they were proposing, I think that park was proposed at $3 billion. Well, um, where were they going to get $3 billion? And now after COVID, it's going to be even more difficult. 
Yeah. So their can their chance to do it was when they had all the private developers putting up the properties, and they could have traded off uh, rights um, for buying a piece of that piece of land. So you would trade out what you're designating. As an example, would be City Place where they all sort of had to they'll contribute or to one developer, but they contribute to that park, and they could have had people um, contributing to that park to make it viable. So the new park actually the new idea isn't as bad. I don't think it's as bad as people are coming out and saying it's still 50 percent uh park space um, so it's the same concepts covering the tracks but there's now well, towers right there's now some towers on yeah it, right but but i think that that was inevitable i don't think that it wasn't viable to build a park that big in the downtown and not have somebody paying most of the ticket for it yeah right yeah. It, just, it just won't happen and so we get all excited and then you know it's not viable so there's a little bit of naivete in that but there, there is, a, I think there is an answer in Toronto. And the thing is, I brought up Bryant Park and I brought up Millennial Park. And the thing about those places, though, is that in the U.S. in particular, um, they leverage their wealthy citizens to get involved in this stuff. Mm -hmm. And they expect them to write checks for public spaces. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, we don't do that at all here. In Europe, they tend to be more public, but they've, all, they've also been there. These public spaces have been there for hundreds of years. So they yeah. don't have to go and assemble a Hyde Park or a Grosvenor yeah. Square. You know, it's already there. Mm -hmm. But in the U.S., when they have these spaces that they're trying to create, um, as an example, I don't know if anybody saw the park that just opened, the mini park that just opened in the Hudson River in New York. It's incredible. Yeah, in what's the, the what's it called? The, the Heatherwick Project, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's wonderful, right? Um, but it's privately financed. The majority of it's privately financed. Mm -hmm. It's uh, got a ton of activity, and it's a great idea. And, you know, we have a, it's a very wealthy city, it's a, but it's a very quietly wealthy city. And nobody's stepping up to actually put their name to a city that they benefit, I mean, in my opinion, they benefited from the city and they should step up. And this would be, I think this is almost your only opportunity. I don't see something like Young Street Basin Park ever getting any beyond being a piece of green grass if they can't get people to step up and say, I'm going to put my name to it. I'm going to build the amenity side of all that. And mm -hmm. so Rail Deck could have happened if somebody would have stepped up. Um, I, I don't know. That's a frustrating part for me because you see these other projects happening and you know that it wasn't all uh, public money because there's only so much public money you can get. So you, you said, uh, you alluded before you answered that last question that there's a solution to it. What's, uh, is that, were you thinking about? Well, I, yeah, the... I think the solution is, I think that the, the solution has got to be, as much as this is not palatable to a lot of people, they have to accept the private involvement. Mm -hmm. I, I just don't think that there's the resources. And frankly, I don't think there's the expertise to, to do the projects at these scales with public funds. You're going to get, they do a great job. Like there's some really cool projects right now, but they, they're finding like, like the Bentway and um, Corktown. They're finding these little locations, but they're really kind of neighborhood sized and they're great. Yeah. They're fantastic. But they're not at a, you know, at a city, city building scale, mm -hmm. right? And you're not going to get a city building scale until you get somebody who's really willing to step up and be a part of it because the city will never have the money to do it. If you did, as an example, look at how difficult it's been to get uh, Nathan Phillips Square finished. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many years have we been watching it, right? So the yeah. improvements are dramatic, they're great. And the finished still... product is not is is only a portion of the initial competition, right? That's correct, yeah. 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 Um, but if you think about it, like I live across the street from High Park and if I'm not mistaken, this was donated by some wealthy industrial 150 years ago. Perfect. There you go. So um, I, yeah. I think you have a good point in saying uh, maybe we need more private money. And I think an advantage of doing that is that uh, those wealthy donors would probably expect more oversight and accountability as to where the money goes. So there's less of an opportunity for boondoggles and people to line their pockets in the process. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah I, I don't know. That's, that is, I mean, I, I'm, I'm being naive in thinking that people are going to write checks for that kind of money. But on the legacy side of things, as you know, as you're seeing, the disparity of income, you know, I think you play to egos or you play to conscience and to see if we can get some things done um, because I think legacy is important. And, uh, you know, I, I, because I think that's almost the only way to get things of extremely high quality done. But that's where we can leverage uh, evolutionary psychology because it, it tells <laughs> us that uh, people yeah. with lots of money um, want to be seen as benefactors to the society yeah. so that's something we could leverage from a, a marketing yeah. and and uh and fundraising perspective say hey we will put your name on this but uh you gotta you gotta pay up right 
And yeah. I mean, if you look at public institutions, they do that all the time. It's like museums and they do. like the AGO. I don't know exactly how it was funded, but I seem, seem to remember that they, they raise money with private donors and stuff to be able to build that uh, Frank Gehry extension. So it's not all that uncommon anyway. No, it's not uncommon. It's a scale at which you're asking people to do it. So, um, you know, the AGO was mostly Thompson that, that uh, contributed to that. Um, a lot of his contribution was the, actually the artwork. Um, and so it was a very generous, but uh, a gift, but not at the scale of making a public space in the city. So you're asking for stuff at a different level. But, you know, in Chicago, the Pritzker family stepped up and built Millennial Park. Mm -hmm. So they were the primary contributor to that. Right. And I'm forgetting who built the park in, in, in um, the, the park that opened in, in, New, in New York. But again, it was pr predominantly a single private uh, contribution. Yeah, and, but at the end of right? the day, it doesn't even really matter who gives the money because it's a public yeah. amenity that people are going to remember for being a great public space. And that's right. You're always going to have the donor's name on it. But like, yeah. you can't, nobody remembers who donated High Park to the city. You can find out if you Google it in two seconds, but their name is not plastered anywhere anymore. Right. Um, yeah. And now High Park is, in my opinion, one of the most beautiful park in the, parks Probably. in the city. Yeah, it's not a, an, an urban space like we're talking about, but it is a beautiful um, uh, green lung. Um, so is there good examples of what you're advocating in Toronto already? And if yes, which are those? Yeah, there's a lot of parks that work that actually work pretty well. None of them at a, at a huge scale. Right. So you've got Edwards Gardens and Allen Gardens and you've got a bunch of them that are uh, do operate in that way. But Toronto does lack it. So if you said to somebody name me it has really kind of interesting uh, kind of behind the scenes public space like one of my favorite ones is the ravine down to the brickworks yeah so it's, it's beautiful it's really interesting it's lovely right yeah so the, the valleys are very much underutilized mm -hmm. so the, once you get in there and you can find them and 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 uh and figure your way around they're amazing right uh tommy thompson park's nice but as far as urban parks go you're really hard pressed to find anything beyond a modest park yeah right That, that you that we can all gather so where do we get we gather at dundas square right we gather at you know and here's a perfect example we gather at maple leaf square which isn't even it's a non-square it's square. not a square it's a street it's corner. a turnaround for a fire truck yeah so it's a bit odd right and so it's interesting we can't identify um there are some other spaces that do work fairly well like roundhouse park makes some sense uh, mm -hmm. as far as being able to do that And these were leaf valve. And the other part of these parks is I'm not going to, uh, I think they're all great because, you know, as we get to be a denser city, the demand for these public spaces is release valve is just going to increase. Mm -hmm. So, you know, building a cork town is fantastic because with the amount of density that's going in there, um, that's a great amenity for those people. They're living in increasingly smaller units and want outdoor space. Yeah. So that's great. Uh, but what, you know, the level that we were trying to tackle scale, it's like, where would you go if you brought someone from out of town, right? Yeah. And is it, is it that good, right? Mm -hmm. So they would be fun if I lived in Cork Town. But, you know, if I got people from out of town, where am I taking them, right? And I want to take them to the island as an example, mm -hmm. but it's not always convenient. So we tackled that one. And then we want to take them to the waterfront. But once we got there, it was like, well, could be better. And that's, a, so these were the things that we were kind of saying, you know, we're never going to be able to level 800 acres of land and build a park. We're going to, try to find and, ex and, and kind of leverage what we have in hand. A really good example, sorry, I'm rambling here, but because I we just keep following them. There's a really great idea to build a park on top of the Allen Expressway. I don't know if you saw this, it got posted this weekend. And no, it was a I haven't seen idea it. idea that got resurrected. Yeah. So you have a depressed parkway, right? Yeah. The parkway under, under the grade of the adjacent neighborhoods. And the idea was, as you're seeing more development go up the Allen Road and underutilized subway stations, was to actually... Uh, fill them in, use the perimeters for development. So you'd have even more people on the edges mm -hmm. and then leave the middle as parkland. Yeah. yeah. There's a brilliant idea. And that's a pretty wide area too. Pretty wide. Yeah. Because you have what, three lanes on each side and you have subway yeah. tracks in the middle and yeah. huge embankments. So yeah, it's probably a few hundred feet wide, right? Yeah. But in that case, the only way you could do it is you've got to, you've got to be willing to enter into a public-private arrangement. Mm -hmm. because somebody's got to pay for it. It's a, it would be a big park. Someone has to pay for it. Um, and so you have to sort of trade off the land you created in order to make the park. Yeah. So where did that proposal come from? 
It actually came from Eberhard Zeidler from years ago, and his daughter resurrected it. And I was like, I read it on the weekend. I was like, it's a brilliant idea. Mm -hmm. Do you it's think great. it's going to go the way of Rail Deck Park and just be forgotten? I don't know. Um, you never know. There's a couple of spaces I want to ask you about specifically. Mm -hmm. uh, one is the lakefront uh, west of uh, west of um, uh, Ontario Place, because there's a huge, it's a huge elongated park that's kilometers long. Yeah, Trillium Park. Um, but even like all the way to oh, Humber, wait, Humber yeah, okay, River. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry, know? sorry. I'm going east. Wait, I went east. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I mean, it's, it's, it's a greenish space and it's pretty well yeah. used. But if you compare it to Chicago, for example, it doesn't even come close. Because Chicago yeah. is basically an elongated park from um, from Millennium Park all the way to the south side. I forget there's a, a kind of a cultural center like yeah. 15 kilometers south of there, and it's an entire park that's yeah. loved and well used and beautiful. And yeah. I don't think we've we've leveraged that space quite well enough in Toronto. What would you do there to uh, to make this huge, narrow but very long piece of land, public land, better? Yeah, I think the basic use of it's great. I mean, because it's a connector, right? So the nice part about it is it, it like there's there's so I would say that if you're putting it under the microscope that we do, right? Mm -hmm. Then it actually works okay. So it's not one that I would put effort into. I, I'll tell you why. Like you almost stay on the water the whole time. You have to go around the boulevard club, but then you get back on the water again. When you get back to Sunnyside, you're back on the water. So it has a once you get down there, it delivers what it promises, which is a waterfront park. Mm -hmm. it is really good for exercising so because the trails are unencumbered i mean obviously a perfect example go when they went north of boulevard club that's when all hell broke loose and um it wasn't wide enough it wasn't thought out enough and somebody got killed a little kid went on the road yeah and a died. couple of years ago yeah a couple yeah, years yeah. ago and that's a perfect example is when it doesn't work work anymore and so but we accept these compromises we accept Martin Goodman Trail going north of uh, Sugar Sugar Factory, and we shouldn't. It's, mm -hmm. it's not the bulk. It's those kind of routes. It's it's dangerous as hell down there. Actually, the amount of bike the bike I haven't figured it out, and the bikes crossing the pedestrians is a nightmare. Now they're trying to figure it out with the new work, but it's going to be a similar problem. But anyway, going back to Sunnyside, Sunnyside um, has uh, it, it has a limited amount of space, so so you it's very difficult to add amenity to it. Um, and they're adding more, if you go further west, they're at, starting to add a little more uh, condominiums and things. So they're going to, but you could add um, some amenity to utilize those spaces. I would say that what they need to do is try to, in the winter, in the summer, they're incredibly well uh, uh, visited. Uh, you know, they're kind of left to their own. Now it's not great down by the water with the wind blowing in, but you know, is that the kind of place toward for those, that neighborhood? that they would get a skating trail or some other things to do mm -hmm. um but again i think that, that one as a connector park is actually you know it's not brilliant but um it does it does a good job yeah yeah that makes sense and what's your yeah. take on uh stacked market uh that was a brilliant idea i loved it why not right so uh the layout was a little weird um but stuff like that's great it's really creative uh it's i mean it's te it's temporary um, but the idea of having, I mean, that idea works really well. And those are the kind of ideas that should, you know, they would be great if they moved into some of these other public spaces, because that's the other thing about the spaces. And when I brought up the Bryant Park idea earlier, Bryant Park, so Stacked, um, the only thing about Stacked, like, it, it's okay. It made it come across as a little less public space and a little more in your wallet. Um, but as an idea, it makes sense. And the idea of temporary idea i believe was based on a concept that was incredibly good in san diego mm -hmm. and what they did in san diego is they used the containers and they made it more of a u-shape and at the end was a stage and so they had bands playing all the time down there yeah. so the pieces around were supporting the public activity mm -hmm. um so that's why i said layout to me didn't work really well because the public space was sort of on on the one edge but um as an idea yeah there it's great use of underutilized space but toronto i think does a really good job of that benway does a good job of that yeah right uh the park the little um that park that's under the gardener by uh corktown with the basketball court oh yeah a that's park. a fantastic space love it right those are great spaces yeah and it, it's been uh, i mean you have the basketball courts you have the skate park and then there's the pole raft sculpture on the other side it's really it's actually a cool space that's for something that's all concrete cool. yeah um yeah 
Uh, the Bentway, I'm, I'm curious, because I've only been there a handful of times, but every time I've gone through, it seems pretty quiet. Is that? Well, that's the thing. Okay, so that's, that's the thing about Bentway, and that's why, like, the, the, my comment earlier about Brand Park with the critical mass. So the Bentway, um, it, it, they do a great job of programming it. Mm -hmm. When it's not programmed, there's really no reason to be there other than when they run the skating, the skating trail, which is awesome. Yeah. So it actually, ironically, does better in the winter. That it's kind of uh, without having uh, specific programs, it's a better space in the winter than the summer. Yeah. Because without a program in the summer, it's a shade. It doesn't. It doesn't do much else. Mm -hmm. um, but there's no reason why the you know the Bentway. That's because what's odd is that it's so close to stacked, and yeah. the Bentway and stacked could have kind of maybe got together and and been a bit more active. But but their approach, I think, is pretty great. And if you apply the same amount of energy into the Bentway, like take the same people that did it, now they have that critical knowledge. And imagine taking those ideas, moving them to the basin of Young, the bottom of Young Street with its critical mass, mm -hmm. you would have a, a project the entire city would know about. Yeah, it's a very good point. Um, I'd like to wrap up and uh, if we can do that on maybe a, a positive note, what would you, yeah. if you were, if you had the ear of the city, what would you tell them or suggest they do um, to have the maximum impact on all residents? A single project or an approach? Uh, either, but I'm more interested in the approach personally. Hmm. The, the approach would be to leverage what they have and complete the projects that they start. That would be it. They, there's so many great ideas that are sitting on shelves that they mm -hmm. could do and execute that would have a huge impact on the city. If they finish the harbor front the way that they drew it, you know, even without the Young Street Basin, that would have a massive impact on the city. There was a study done for the Don Valley that included a whole bunch of, um, uh, not a whole bunch, it included two of them. It included two bicycle bridges, that's all it needed. And with two bicycle bridges, it made that experience dramatically better. You're not having to stop to cross a street light, you are staying mostly in nature. Um, I think that they have things that they've just sort of not finished. It's like, if you're going to do it, let's get things done 100%. And I think that that's my fear with the islands is that by, by accepting the compromise, mm -hmm. I, my, my comment would be don't accept any compromise. Do the projects one at a time and figure out how to finish them completely before moving on to the next projects. I that would that's... be it. You just see compromise time and time and time again and it's time to fix the islands and fix them properly yeah uh, not try to make people get on the ferry when they don't want to get on the ferry that's, that's so it's of... not necessarily about the grand gesture but doing no. things that are more tailored to improving uh, how things work yeah because i think they have space available and i think they have space available to make the grand gesture mm -hmm. it's there right so it's going to be i mean i think the litmus test for all this is the portlands yeah. If that if that turns out the way that they have drawn it, and what you're seeing, they have incredible ideas down there. I don't know if you've seen it, but they have actually an activity park that you uh, along the they're making a river, and you follow along the river, and then you would do like exercises or play. Mm -hmm. That is a brilliant idea, right? Mm -hmm. They have created basically waterfront down there, so you can actually sit in in sort of pass, in, in tranquil space near the water, looking back at the city. That's a brilliant idea. Let's see them finish this thing right so yeah. you know the money well we got this far we got the buildings in and then we kind of ran out of money and we didn't do it like this is the most frustrating part about the city is so many great ideas and then they they uh you know they kind of fizzle on the execution um finish nathan phillips square this is an example right um and then sometimes some hard decisions like i i, I found a little bit about the sugar factory since since proposing that they shouldn't be there but that's another example is that you know that's a city that really needs to figure out something like that. And, you know, it's not in the public good to have it there anymore. And I work literally across the street from it. We stand yeah. right at it in yeah. our windows. And it could be put to better use. And so that's the bold gesture that needs to happen, right? To, to incentivize the uh, red path from to move elsewhere. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, and, and they were talking, the same idea was um, uh, when they, there was uh, talk about um, demolishing Rogers uh, Center, and rebuilding yeah. a new it's like it didn't make sense to me why would you keep a, a baseball stadium in such a dense area why wouldn't you incentivize them to move elsewhere and then and then repurpose that as a public space 
Yeah. Well, what was funny about that is we, we actually posted something. We didn't make it a rebellious one, but we were, we kind of, I actually think there were, I have a bit of um, affinity for the Rogers Center. I did some work in there uh, on the 200 level when uh, things were getting really interesting. Um, I actually think the Rogers Center suffers from uh, the fact it's not very pretty. Yeah. I mean, it just looks unfinished. And I think that actually if they had finished the building and spent a little bit more on its character and its edges, that sounds silly because that's an incredibly superficial opinion of a building yeah. and of urban planning. But I think from an urban planning point of view, it's in the right location, right? So it attracts, I mean, at night, it fills all the restaurants. It does a good job and it's convenient by transit. Uh, there's a lot of things that work for it. It's just unattractive. And we actually pitched an idea where we prettied up the outside of it. Mm -hmm. And then we know the problem with it. Cause I was, when I did the work at the Rogers Center, I proposed to take out 450 seats, yeah. which they, or they put out and it worked really well because the sight lines got better. Yeah. So our idea behind it was take out, it currently holds about 48,000 seats. Yeah. Our concept is take out 16,000 seats, take it down to 32,000 seats, fill the outfield with gardens and parks, Mm -hmm. right and then overgrow the thing so the roof is open yeah only yeah. for when it's not closed as opposed to the other way around it only closes in really bad weather and mm -hmm. it doesn't even close it only covers like what they do in seattle so you mm -hmm. just got stopping rain no more air conditioned space it's a waste of resources right it's just shielding you from the rain you could take the whole front panel off and then fill it with gardens and make it so you can sit and watch the game in the garden space, uh, if you look at what Oakland A's uh, proposed for their stadium, they had literally built a garden on top of the stadium and sunk the stadium into the ground. Mm -hmm. So you could actually be in the garden looking down into the stadium. Oh, that's really an idea, in right? interesting idea, yeah. Yeah, and there's other people in the stadium design world. There's a lot of people doing really interesting experiential things. And a lot of it has to do with getting back to nature. And I think that the Rogers Center, yeah, I don't, I don't think they, sh I think they should have a competition and say, what do you got? How can you fix this thing? Because mm -hmm. you're right, taking it, like, moving it now or taking it down is, I can't see it. Like, where are you going to go? Is a big, big question, right, for the team. Yeah. Portland's was an obvious choice, but now that's, you know, sort of almost spoken for. Mm -hmm. um, interesting, though. But yeah, Rogers Center is a, that's an interesting challenge. I think it's cool. Well, we'll see what happens to it. Yeah. Um, I want to thank you very much for your time oh, and welcome. generosity. It was a very interesting conversation. And hopefully yeah, it's, thanks. there's going to be many more of those. That'd be great. I'd love to chat again. Hey, Arno here. I hope you've enjoyed this episode and that you'll come back for more. Please share with your friends and colleagues and remember to subscribe on our website at rvltr.studio. Follow us on social media at revelator underscore T-O. It's R-E-V-E-L-A-T-E-U-R underscore T-O. Until next time, ciao.